So our first speaker, I actually have notes here. Um, uh, Dr. Jeff Weber is Deputy Director of the Paul Muter Cancer Center at NYU Lagone Medical Center. I told you last night, these people have titles that it's just like, how do you do this? How do you put this on a business card? It doesn't work. Um, he's also co-director of the Melanoma Research Program, primary research interest, lie in the field immunotherapy for cancer, has a great deal of experience treating patients with immunotherapies. We know all this. Um, so he was uh, uh, a longtime uh, principal investigator and director of the Moffitt Cancer Center SPORE grant. SPORE grant is a special program of uh, research excellence. There are a handful of these across the country in the melanoma area. They're humongous big grants from the NIH given only to the top institutions. He was the one that made that possible at Moffitt when he was there. Um, and we have a couple of Moffitt people here who are angry with you, Jeff, for leaving. I just want you to know. <laughs> Be warned. Um, and uh, anyway, the main thing you need to know is this is a person who really, really knows this stuff, uh, has moved the field forward, and has provided great care to a great number of patients. And I'll just say uh, personally that every time uh, I've had a patient or somebody talk to me about a problem that just seemed really, really challenging and tough, uh, and I've had a chance to chat with, with uh, Jeff about this, he's come forward with really insightful thoughts uh, and has always been helpful anytime we've needed it. So I appreciate that. And Jeff, I'll turn it over to you. So uh, it's, it's of some interest that I actually have not been in this area in 30, 31 years, maybe, because I lived in New York for 30 years, left, came back less than a year ago, and I didn't realize you could actually walk in a pedestrian arcade without getting hit by a car <laughs> from 42nd Street all the way here. So that was uh, like a big deal. I mean, it looks good. No, New York's been a fun place, and NYU is a place that I think is on the rise. So what I will do and what I was asked to do is to sort of go through the historical background. Some of it will be hysterical background because there are a lot of funny anecdotes that go along with this. And I've tried to make this a little bit anecdotal because there are some interesting scenarios uh, that occur during the development of these, we call them checkpoint inhibitors, ipilimumab, nivolumab, pembrolizumab. And I'll give you some background. I will try to keep this not too technically significant. I'm going to try to keep this more anecdotal than anything else. So first, I think everybody in the room would agree the problem. And George Canellos was the physician-in-chief at Dana-Farber. And he has this classic remark, which I always repeat, it's a bad disease. It's the tumor that gives cancer a bad name. He said this, and I actually sat next to him at a dinner like this once, and he said, yeah, that's exactly what I said. He's now, I believe, retired and uh, still with us, semi-retired. But I think melanoma is a bad disease. Um, and trying to figure out how to get the immune system to deal with it has been the holy grail of cancer therapy over the last, geez, 100 plus years, ever since the days of William Coley, who was a, a physician and a surgeon at, at what was then Memorial Hospital. Now, of course, it's Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. So what, what is the immune system? It, it, it's a part of your body that evolved over many millennia of human existence as a way to get rid of infection, because that was always the biggest threat, right? 10,000 years ago, the average lifespan was like 30 years. Cancer was a non-issue. Your biggest threat was either getting eaten by a saber-toothed tiger, trampled by an elephant, a woolly mammoth, or getting killed by one of your fellow humans in competition for food or whatever. So bacterial infection and viral infection were the biggest threat. So that's why the immune system developed in us, we're like, we're vertebrates, we're mammals, we're complicated multi-cell organisms. And those are the only organisms that have a real immune system, and it comes in two pieces. There's the innate, which is like the built-in immune system, which happened early in development, and then there's the adaptive. Adaptive is the one that we think about when we think about manipulating it for cancer. And you have both chemicals, most of which are made by the innate immune system, and also by the adaptive immune system, and you have cells that work. So the innate immune system is your first line of defense. It's like always there. It's like uh, the police at the corner of 42nd and Times Square. They're there. They're looking over. And by the way, there are police all over the place. This city is very well protected. They're just waiting for trouble. They're primed. They're armed. <laughs> and if anything happens, they're going to be there on the spot, and they'll take care of it. Uh, it's the first line of defense. It's pre-existing. Uh, what are the innate immune cells? We call them macrophages and neutrophils. They're always cruising around, and they're just primed just there. There are guards. They're waiting for trouble. 
it's not selective and it's not educated in the sense of it's, is it, it's not very specific. It's just on the lookout for any problem. It's sort of kill first and ask questions later, which is where it differs from the police, obviously. The, ad <laughs> the adaptive immune system is the other side of the coin, much more complex, and it has very specific selective cells, B cells and T cells. And they're educated in the sense that they can learn and adapt change, so that's why we call it the adaptive immune system. They have memory. They can recall what happened 30 years ago. As an example, I was immunized against hepatitis in, let me think, it was 1975. It's now 41 years later. I still have hepatitis titers in my bloodstream. Think about that. A cell that's been hanging around for 40 years, that's pretty impressive. And it's those cells are still in my bloodstream. They're still making antibodies, and I'm theoretically still protected against getting hepatitis, which is good if you're dealing with blood products and stuff. So that's part of the adaptive immune system. It's long-lasting and it has, it has memory. And they're very specific. My antibodies against hepatitis B ain't gonna help me if I get exposed to hepatitis A. So they're very specific. They're not general. So what's the problem? It sounds great, we all have great immune systems. Why shouldn't that get rid of cancer? Well, the problem is the cancer cells, shockingly, aren't that much different than your normal cells. If you look at all the genes that are produced or the gene products that are made, the proteins, it's like 99% plus the same stuff that you see with your normal cells. There aren't that many proteins different in a cancer cell than there are in a normal cell. And they're very clever, these tumor cells, as you all know. They quickly evolve to lose stuff that could be recognized as abnormal by the immune system. They're not stupid. Not only that, they have active suppression. Passive means they hide. They, but they can also have active suppression. They can make a smoke screen. They can lose expression of things that could be recognized, but they could gain expression of things that suppress the immune system. And finally, patients who are sick, who've gotten chemotherapy and other therapies, the immune system in general is somewhat compromised by the fact that patients are ill. So it doesn't work very well there either. So you have this real hurdle you have a tumor that's trying to suppress the immune system, it's trying to hide from the immune system, and you have a patient whose immune system isn't working that well in the first place. So keep in mind, uh, you got a lot of hurdles to jump over, plus the fact the immune system wasn't put there to defend against cancer. Uh, it was always infection and trauma that were the risks to life and limb. And as I said, uh, cancer is the disease of a long life. Cancer is a disease of a post-industrial world. The average incidence of cancer is fifth, sixth, seventh decades. People didn't evolve to live that long until, I don't know, a couple of thousand years ago. It was a non-issue. You know, you died young. But now, you know, lifespans are fantastic. We're into the 80s, and people in their 80s are in great shape. When I was a kid, someone who was 80 was like a real curiosity. <laughs> now I have 80-year-old patients who are still working. Uh, you know, I hope to keep working till I'm in my mid to late 70s. That Around the time of World War II, forget it, that didn't happen. But anyway, cancer is a disease of those people who have a long lifespan. So that's why it's a disease of the post-industrial era. So how do the immune cells work? Well, I'm gonna run over here. This shows the immune system in infection, which frankly is most of its activity, because most of us don't have lots of cancer all the time. But at any rate, it's the same system in cancer. You have your innate cells cruising around, and they're looking for trouble. And if they see a cell that becomes transformed or abnormal, or in this case, an infected cell, they're gonna basically gobble it up. So here, gobbled up the cell, let's say it's the cancer cell, and then stimulates your immune cells, the T cells, the adaptive cells. So the innate cell helps to stimulate the adaptive cells. And you need both. So if the cancer cell gets gobbled up by the macrophage, the innate cell, it's going to show it or present it, so they, that's why they call them presenting cells, to the adaptive cells. We call them helper cells and memory cells. And eventually, one of these cells becomes a killer cell. And those are the guys we like because the killer cell has the capacity to secrete stuff which can kill the tumor cells. And it actually can literally latch on with different receptors that are very specific to the tumor cell and then just kill it because it makes poisons, and those poisons can zap those cancer cells. Getting that to happen, like I said, is the holy grail. And this is the person we want. This is the guy. This is the killer cell. 
you don't want cells that can't kill. You want cells that could literally destroy the tumor. And getting enough of them and getting them to sit around and last for a long enough time and not be suppressed and not have the tumor be hidden from them is the key. So let's talk about CTLA-4. Perhaps people in this room have been treated with ipilimumab. I know some of you have. Ipilimumab is an antibody against CTLA-4. What happens is there's a yin and a yang. And in fact, I should go to the next slide. Yep, it's there. In the immune system, there's always a yin and a yang. There's always a break and an accelerator. And the immune system is kind of like your car, right? To get the car to work, you know, you need an accelerator, right? You press on the accelerator, the car drives. But you also need a brake. You can't be without stopping. It's not always moving. And you have multiple brakes. You have, like, the regular brake, and then you have the parking brake. And actually, in cars today, there are multiple braking systems, just like in trucks and big vehicles. And that's a recent development. So there are all kinds of redundant multiple brakes, and then there's the parking brake. Anyone ever try to start a car with the parking brake engaged? I have. Usually it's a rental car where I'm not familiar with the car. The immune system in cancer is like you trying to drive your car with the parking brake on. It kind of drives, and I mean, it sort of moves forward, but it's kind of sluggish and doesn't work very well. And that's roughly what happens with your immune system in cancer. And if you could, you look down and you say, oh my God, the parking brake's on. You release the parking brake, and now the car drives very nicely. Taking an antibody against CTLA-4 is like cutting the parking brake and maybe one of the regular brake cables. Now the car drives really well. The immune system works really well. The problem is stopping is a bit of an issue. And not being able to stop is what happens when you get the side effects. So you can drive really well. But uh, getting it to stop is a bit of a problem. So that's basically what this shows. Normally, you have an immune system that has all these interactions say, between the tumor cell and the T cell. They have to link together to be destroyed. They have to give signals. So that linkage has to give some signal to the T cell to kill it. And what happens is, as soon as this happens, this recognition, the opposite happens. So for every action, there's an opposite, an equal reaction. So the break almost automatically is turned on. So as soon as the immune cell starts to rev up and make all kinds of poisons and divide, the immune system gets a signal, ooh, got to slow down. Because when you guys get a flu infection, all those immune cells in the lungs, you don't want them to stay there forever. You're going to get sick. You'll get a fever. You'll feel lousy for a few days. And then the immune system clears the virus. You feel better, and then everything goes back to normal. Because the immune cells get a signal to slow down, stop growing, and they just sort of disappear and go back to your usual self. Well, the problem is in, in, in cancer, that signal to go away is too strongly turned on. So if you had an antibody that could block it, and those antibodies were ipilimumab and tremolimumab, you could take off the brakes. So instead of prematurely having the immune system contract and come to a shuddering halt, it would continue. And that's good because you want to continue to have the immune system recognize the tumor. It's bad if you have too many immune cells because they're going to cause immune toxicity. But this was all developed in the 1990s by Jim Allison and a guy named Jeff Bluestone, who I suspect will get a Nobel Prize soon. I think uh, Allison won the Lasker Award, which is the precursor usually to the Nobel Prize. And I think this was an amazing revelation, tremendous observation. And he then came up with the idea that, well, if this acts as the break, what if we blocked it? Would that help the immune system? And well, like I said, when you activate the immune cell, the break almost automatically comes on. It's a little different in your car. In your car, you don't activate the brake until you have to stop. The immune system is a little different. It kind of, as soon as you hit the, it's like a, as soon as you hit the accelerator, 10 minutes later, the brake has to come on, meaning it's a little different because the immune system, if it's too activated, is going to kill you. You can drive your car for hours if you feel like it on the freeway. It's not going to harm you. But the immune system is a little different. So it turns out in mice, and this is what the scientists did, that CTLA-4 was very highly expressed on certain cells, and it was also highly expressed on cells that suppress the immune system. We call that a suppressor cell. And it sounded like, you know, blocking it would be a great idea. How do you block it? You make an antibody. So this just shows one of many, many experiments. And back in, I think it was 99, I went to the library at USC, which is where I was. I was in Los Angeles at the time. 
And I read an article that showed these kinds of data, and I said, damn, that's a great idea, because they had tumors that grew in mice. And they tried to treat them. Nothing worked. They kept growing. And this just shows, over time, progressive growth of the tumors. But if they gave this antibody with a vaccine, tumors stopped growing, and they pretty much went away, very markedly so. And this was a melanoma tumor that generally you just couldn't treat it any other way. Any immune stimulation, any immune manipulation, total waste of time. And interestingly enough, when you treated the mice, they developed vitiligo. Vitiligo is loss of pigment. Some of you probably have it. So the mouse, which is black, started to turn white. So that said there was an attempt by the immune system to attack the pigment cells. And what's melanoma? It's a tumor of pigment cells, right? And melanocytes. So this was the first indication that it might work. And I read this article in the library in Los Angeles, and I said, damn, that's a great idea. We have to get that antibody. Who makes it? So I looked it up, and it was a company called Medirex. And I immediately called them up and said, you know, guys, I, I've worked with you before. Could we get some of this antibody to test in the test tube? And by the way, uh, I'd like to write a grant. Could we get this to test it as a booster for a vaccine strategy? Well, OK, they said, sure, yeah, it's going to be entering trial soon. Uh, we'll see what we can do for you. And I got the drug eventually, and it probably was about 2001. It was two or three years later I wrote a grant, applied to the FDA. It literally took two years to get the drug into patients. And I ended up giving it with a vaccine on the interesting and probably incorrect assumption that it would boost vaccine responses because it was such a potent immunogen. Well, that probably wasn't the case, but it doesn't matter because I started treating patients, and I guess I was about the second or third person in the U.S. doing it. And I had a guy who was a cardiologist who came to see me who had this gigantic mass that had just grown through his chest wall. It was this big bump. On, it was on his back. And it literally was this big. And I figured it was a subcutaneous mass. But when I looked at his CAT scan, it was growing out of the middle of his chest, out beyond the skin. And it was just, he couldn't sleep on, on his back. It was just gigantic. He had failed chemotherapy. He had failed high dose IL-2. And he had no options. Very nice guy. And I... We had a nipolimumab trial, one of the first ones in the U.S., and I put him on this trial. And he came back after the first dose, and mm, maybe it was softening up, maybe not, hard to tell. After the second dose, uh, he came in, and he took his shirt off, and I looked, and I said, whoa, it's not this. It's like this. And I said, wow. And it's always that wow moment. That's what we, as the, invest the investigational oncologist lives for the wow moment. They live in the old days when you had scans that you put up on the screen on the light box. They live for that first evaluation scan, and you can't see any tumor. And you say, my god, is it the right patient? And you look <laughs> at the number. Is it the right date? And you realize, ah, it's working. At any rate, after a couple of treatments, he wasn't taking his pain medicines. The mass was shrinking. And then after 12 weeks, he got four doses of Ipi, and it was like almost gone. On the x-ray, it was virtually dis it had virtually disappeared. And by his next dose, gone. And he, he's alive and well today. This is would have been about 02, so that's 14 years later. So we assume he's cured. I think that's a good assumption. And then after I saw this, I said, OK, I believe this drug works. And he was the first. And then there was a string of patients that we saw with similar kinds of things. And we realized that the drug worked, although it didn't work very quickly. After a first dose, not much happened. It literally would take four doses over two or three months to work. And this led to a clinical trial. And this just shows, it's one of the few technical things I'll show. It just shows when you take patients who had failed all other therapy like him and you treated them with this ipilimumab or ipilimumab with a vaccine because we kind of thought it would work well with the vaccine versus just the vaccine, obviously I'd rather be on the pink or the brown curve than the yellow curve. And it's also said that you had a plateau. And if you go back to the 2000 era, the plateau for patients who had chemotherapy, IL-2, and all this other stuff was about over here. It was about 10% survival at five years. <laughs> and some of those patients were probably cured. Now it was 20%. So we had doubled it. And that's pretty good because this was in 2010. And then in 2011, the FDA took the data and said, OK, we will approve this drug. And so this was the first drug ever shown in a randomized trial to benefit patients with melanoma in terms of promoting their survival. So that's a good thing. So further patients were treated, in fact, thousands of patients. And it confirmed that there was a, 
plateau. And that plateau is probably about 20%. And that meant that those patients are probably cured. Because if you were alive at three years, which is where the yellow dot is, you were almost surely alive at five years and seven years and eight years. So for the first time, we actually started thinking about the C word, and the C word is cure. And we actually had a lot of optimism. On the other hand, we realized that there were all kinds of weird things about this drug. We realized that the tumors didn't just like shrink and then go away and stay away. <clears throat> In some cases, the tumors grew and then shrank. In some cases, you would have new tumors pop up, which usually is bad news, meant you have to abandon ship and do something else. And then, then all the tumors would go away. I mean, this is weird. This doesn't happen with chemotherapy. I mean, with chemotherapy, what you see is what you get. If you have a lung cancer patient who gets carboplatinum and taxol, the tumor either shrinks or it doesn't shrink by week six, and then by week 12, you're almost done. And then, unfortunately, the time to return is relatively short because chemotherapy probably doesn't cure many patients with lung cancer, or at least it didn't back in the old days. So this is weird stuff, and we began to notice crazy stuff like this. So the patient starts out with all this lumpy stuff in the skin, totally abnormal. And then after a, couple of, after a dose, the lumpy stuff looks a lot worse. And in fact, if you examine the patient, the lumpy stuff was like a lot worse. He had doubled the size of the tumors. And usually with chemotherapy, when that happens, it ain't going to get better. But you know, we knew that these weird patterns occurred, so we hung in there. And then after the four doses, this is month three or month four, all of a sudden, they're almost totally gone. I mean, this is very strange. Now, did this happen in half the patients? No, it probably happened in five, six, seven percent of the patients. But it was striking enough so that you had to have a different way of doing things. You could not abandon ship too easily. And uh, at the time, there was a popular song by Kenny Rogers called The Gambler. And in the song The Gambler, which I used to drive my nurses nuts by playing in the clinic on a little video clip, <laughs> It, there's a line by Kenny Rogers where he says repetitively, you have to know when to hold and when to fold, because that's playing poker. So that's the kind of the theme. You ha we had to figure out when to hold and when to fold. So it made things a little complicated, and it brought in a little judgment into a world of rigorousness and cookbook pathways, which is the way medicine tends to be done today. We have very certain ways of doing things, and that's the way you have to do it. But now we had the, the judgment element, which made it very interesting. And this is from Jed Walchok, who's a colleague up at Memorial. And this is an old slide, but it's striking because it's the exception that proves the rule. It was a most unusual case of a guy who, I think he was a school teacher, that was treated with ipilimumab. And after his first four doses at week 12, I think it's pretty obvious on the upper right-hand side that there's a zillion little holes in the liver, and those are all tumors. I mean, obviously, the patient was progressing. He felt terrible. His uh, liver functions were abnormal. So this is not good. So they stopped the treatment, and they waited to put him on some other experimental trial, thinking this is not good, things are not going well, but we'll try our best. And then they had to wait a long time for whatever reason to get him on the trial. It hadn't opened. And it took till literally two months later, eight weeks later, for them to get the guy on a trial, and they got his pretreatment scan, and they kind of thought he looked better. And usually when you progress, it's like you don't just get better. But at week 20, huh, all those big dots, are, all those big circles are now little dots. And they said, whoa, we're not going to put this guy on a trial. He's getting better. We're going to wait. So they waited, and then they almost all disappeared. And I think they literally have disappeared, and the guy, I believe, is alive today, years later. So he had what we call progression followed by regression. I mean, this is weird stuff. So it really makes it complicated for the patient and the doc because you have to decide when to hold and when to fold. And that requires some serious judgment. And the other thing we realized early on, and this was hilarious stuff on occasion, patients had weird side effects. I mean, so weird that they had never been seen in the state of nature before. Uh, when I first got into this in 01 and 02, my old boss, uh, who's still the chief of surgery at the NCI, Steve Rosenberg, just had his 76th birthday, still going strong. He called me up and said, Jeff, Jeff, have uh, you been uh, treating patients with ipilimumab? I said, yes. And I, uh, he said, have you seen any patients with severe diarrhea and like an ulcerative colitis-like syndrome? And I said, heck no, I've treated like 10 patients. And the key is I was treating them at low doses, escalating the dose. And I said, 
I don't know, it's like giving salt water. It's like really well tolerated. And he said, oh, come on, that's impossible. I've, I've treated 20 patients and I've seen like six patients with severe colitis. How could this be? What is it, the, a difference in the water in, in Los Angeles versus Washington where he was? I said, I don't know. So he was frustrated, hung up. A week later, <laughs> a week later, I jacked the dose up and treated my first patient at, at a higher dose. And the guy who was from Dana Point, actually, I still remember him, he's still alive. This is now 14 years later. Um, he called in saying he had severe diarrhea, couldn't read the newspaper, his eyes were all red, and he had a fever of 103. And I said, have your wife put you in the car, drive up immediately to LA, which is about an hour and a half drive. He comes in, he got hospitalized, he was sick as hell, and he got better, we put him on steroids, and he left the hospital eventually, but he had colitis. So I called the, my boss back and said, uh, Steve, I think I, I need to change my mind. I, I, I've seen this, this is pretty impressive. This was pretty impressive stuff. Um, and these kinds of side effects do not exist anywhere other than in the realm of using these drugs. Uh, so what we found is that the drug could inflame organs. Remember I told you cutting the brake is great, it allows the car to drive. Well, stopping the car is not so easy, and stopping the car is like, not being able to stop the car is like seeing the immune-related side effects. So we had inflammation of the colon, inflammation of the liver, and then we had other really weird stuff that I had never seen, like inflammation of the pituitary. I mean, the pituitary doesn't get inflamed. I mean, it's just the way it is. In pregnant women who then deliver, they can have infarction, meaning um, a destruction of the pituitary. It's called Sheehan's syndrome. But to have actual inflammation of the pituitary, it would be a publishable phenomenon if you ever saw it. But like two, three percent of the patients were having inflammation of the pituitary, and this is what it looks like. It may not look like much. The pituitary is very small, the size of my pinky now. And it's like at the base of your brain, and it's this important thing, it controls your hormones. That would be a doubling of the pituitary, and it's not homogeneous, it's not like light gray, it's light gray, dark gray, a different texture. That means it's all inflamed. And patients would present with a headache, and they would get really tired, and they'd come in, and we would figure brain metastases, and we'd get them it's an MRI, and the radiologist would call up and say, no, I don't see any metastases, but you know, the pituitary looks weird. And we began to realize that these patients had crazy stuff. So the first time I ever saw it was a guy who came in to see me. He was actually getting adjuvant ipilimumab, meaning it was given after surgical removal. And he had a metastatic lung melanoma removed, and he was on this adjuvant trial. So, and he was, to be honest, not the most pleasant guy. And after a <laughs> couple of doses, he comes in with his wife, and by the way, the nurses really didn't like him, but he was just this angry, not pleasant guy. So after two doses, his wife, a little misspelling there, his wife reported he had a behavior change. And I said, well, wh what happened? So he walked in, he sits down, and looks like this. And this is a guy who's normally pretty active, but vaguely not that hackable. Okay, fine, that's the way he is. So. And I said, so what's the problem? Said, well, he's, his behavior has changed. He's, he's, and I said, how? Well, he started to act nice and treat me well. <laughs> and oh, and by the way, he stopped drinking. I said, when he stopped drinking? So I went to the chart. In those days, we had old paper charts. And I looked at my history. And to be honest, I take a good history. And it said drinking denied. And I looked at him and I said, what do you mean? You said you don't drink. He said, well, you know, sometimes I have a couple or three four, five, six drinks. I said, what do you mean six drinks? Six drinks a night is an alcoholic. Is my <laughs> so it turned out he was an alcoholic and he had hit it. And I said, oh, for God's sake. So I figured he had a, a frontal brain metastasis because when you get a brain metastasis here, it changes behavior. It's classic. Sent him upstairs. Luckily, uh, at that particular day, it was a Friday. They had a light schedule. They just got him right in. in this is in Los Angeles at USC. And the radiologist, who was a friend of mine, called me up and said, you know, your usual batting average is now down. You predicted to me this would be a brain metastasis. Nope, no brain metastasis. And I said, okay, fine. Anything else? He said, you know, the pituitary looks funny. I said, what do you mean the pituitary looks funny? Well, it's a little bigger than usual, and it's inhomogeneous. Hmm. So, okay, why don't you send him back down? We're going to draw his, his pituitary functions. We'll get the ACTH, the cortisol, the TSH, the thyroid-stimulating hormone. Comes back down, we draw these things, and he's really moving slow, but we got the blood, sent him off. And the guy who was the head of the lab that day was also a friend, and he called me up. It was a light day for them. 
It was the end of the day, Friday. And he said, you know, you're gonna have to redraw the blood. Uh, we just ran the TSH and the ACTH and it's like below the detectable limit. I said, what? what? Come on with your damn machine. Was it working earlier today? Yeah. Okay, we'll redraw the blood. We redraw the blood, send them back up. Half an hour later, he calls up and says, no, it's confirmed. He has no ACTH and no TSH. And I said, this is not possible. You can't live without the hormone stimulating hormones. Come on. Well, it turned out he had like no ACTH, no TSH. His cortisol was like zero and his thyroid hormone was undetectable. So I sat down and thought about it and said, oh, for Christ's sake, he's got pituitary dysfunction. His pituitary is not working. And we put him back on pills to give him back his hormones and didn't to keep him in the hospital. He went home. I called him the next day. He felt a little better. And the next Friday, he came back, and he bops in the room, sits down, looking like his usual self. And his wife is with him. And I said, so, how's he doing? He said, oh, much better. He's treating me like crap, and he's drinking again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and he's drinking again. This is great. So that was, and this is a true story. So this is how I learned about the, the pituitary, because to be honest, I, my endocrinology was modest. We, I mean, in cancer, you don't deal with this stuff. So I had to go back to the textbook and relearn all the stuff that, that I was supposed to have learned as a medical student, which had gone in one side and out the other. And uh, he was the first, and there were many after him, and it became a regular routine. Every time we saw someone with worsening fatigue that didn't ca make sense, we would check these hormone parameters, and we began to see a lot of people with this problem. In fact, we saw people with pituitary inflammation that had the worst headache of their life and were in the hospital for days on a morphine drip. Crazy stuff. And then other interesting weird stuff, and this is uh, from Tony Rivas, who's a friend at UCLA. I'm not sure how easy it is to see. It's a guy at the baseline, and after getting, this is a PD-1 antibody, he developed vitiligo, loss of pigment. And here's examples of loss of pigment. Mm -hmm. And again, in the IL-2 era, when people got hiatus IL-2, every once in a rare while they got vitiligo, and it usually was associated with doing well. Well, it turns out that it was really associated with doing well, because here is something that we just published last year, showing if you got vitiligo getting these antibodies, here's your survival. That's pretty damn good. If you didn't get vitiligo, it was a lot worse. And if you got skin toxicity, you did pretty well. If you didn't get skin toxicity, you didn't do as well. So this idea came about that there was this rough association between getting some of, some of the side effects and doing well. And this was, in the realm of oncology, it's not unique, but it's almost unique. Because with chemotherapy, there's zero relation between the side effects and how well you do. With these drugs, it's a little hard to differentiate having side effects from doing well. Okay, so this was 01, 02, things are looking good. By the time you get to 2010, we have the definitive evidence I showed you, and the drug gets approved in 2011. But around 04, 05, people were beginning to look elsewhere, thinking this is promising. What other breaks are there on the immune system? Well, back in the 90s, there was a guy named Hanjo in Japan who discovered something called PD-1, program death one. He cloned the gene, he isolated the molecule, and it was found to be this thing that induced program death in immune cells. People didn't think much of it, but more work was done around 04, 05, showing that, or actually it was really 02, 03, showing that you could potentially block this thing, that it was another break, and it, an antibody against it should function like CTLA-4 antibody. The irony is it turned out to be the more important break. And just a little cartoon, if the immune cell sees the tumor cell, it has to link with these linkages. So this thing called the T cell receptor recognizes the tumor cell. There are these other linkages I showed you. And then there's yet a third linkage. And the third linkage, though, for us is not a good one. It's a break. PD-1 on the immune cell is the break. And when it finds its partner, which is called PD-L1, brings everything to a halt. So it's like CTLA-4. It's another break. So it turns out this is a pretty a much more potent break. And the weird thing is that PDL1, which binds the PD1 and gives the cell a signal to stop, to break, is ectopically or abnormally made by almost every tumor cell that we know, or every type of tumor. So it's diabolical. The tumor itself contains within it the ability to suppress the T cells that are trying to destroy it. 
PDL1 normally would not be present on your normal cells. It's only on your immune cells. So the immune cells interact with one another. And why do they interact? As I told you, after you get a flu infection, you know, you can't just keep making flu cells forever. You've got to slow it down. There's a yin and then there's a yang. So then the question is, like with the CTLA-4 antibody, did it shrink tumors in mice? And the answer is, yeah. So again, I was in the library. I looked in the literature, and I saw stuff like this. So this is with the antibody. This is without. So in all these different types of tumors, you could shrink melanoma. You could shrink all kinds of tumors now. CTLA-4 tended to be a melanoma kind of thing. This is with any kind of tumor. If you gave the mice that had the tumor this antibody to block the PD-1, it worked pretty well. And that's encouraging. So this set up a whole bunch of trials. And the first trial was done at several institutions. And here's the result of that trial. Years later, this trial was started in, oh my goodness, probably 05 or 06. And the long-term data showed, yet again, a plateau. And again, now the plateau is not at 20%. Look where the plateau is. It's at about 35%. So now we're doing even better. And these, are, again, are patients who failed all other therapies. They were going to do poorly. They were not going to do well. So now the bar went from 10% at the baseline to 20% with the ipilimumab, and now it's at 35%. Not bad. We're making some progress. So that was a trial that was started quite a while ago, and that led to a randomized trial. So, you know, to get a drug approved in the U.S., as I showed you with the ipilimumab, you've got to do a randomized trial. So here's the randomized trial that led to the approval for one of the PD-1 antibodies, nivolumab. And there's another one called pembrolizumab, which is literally, they're made by different companies, but they're very similar drugs. I would say if I had melanoma and I was being treated, I'd want to be on the red curve, not the white curve. So the red curve is the PD-1 antibody. The white curve, or light blue curve, is chemotherapy, which in those days and this is around the 2010 era, was the standard frontline therapy. And this was a trial done in Europe. In the U.S., we, had, we decided not to do this because we had other options that had just been approved. But I'd say that's a pretty big difference. From across the room, it's pretty obvious those survival curves are very different. So this ultimately led in 2014 to the approval of both nivolumab and pembrolizumab. And this just shows pembrolizumab, the other one, can work really well. This is an unusual variant of melanoma that's very hard to treat called desmoplastic melanoma. And it, uh, they often are on the face, around the jaw. It's just it's a horrible disease. And it shows you can shrink this sucker away and make it go away completely with, uh, with pembrolizumab, which is the other PD-1 antibody. And that also got approved in 2014. So we actually had two drugs that would be approved. And what it did was it had – and this is something – this is a plot showing the reduction in the mass of the tumor. As you can see, most of the lines are down. Uh, we did very well. And weirdly enough, the reason why this particular variant of melanoma was so responsive was that it had lots of gene changes, mutations. So we're not going to go into that in any detail, but it turns out that the more mutations you have, the better you do, because when the genes are mutated, you then have abnormal proteins that can be recognized by the immune system. So what's the conclusion? And I have a few more slides, not too many more. These PD-1 antibodies and the CTLA-4 antibodies are outstanding additions to the armamentarium. CTLA-4 antibodies, to be honest, are more toxic than the PD-1 antibodies. But weirdly enough, the PD-1 antibodies are the better break, so they work better, higher response rates. The response rate with PD-1 antibodies? be as high as 45 percent. That ain't bad. That's pretty darn good. And there are fewer side effects than most other drugs. And if you respond, you're probably going to stay there for a long time. And again, for the second time, we began to think even more strongly about talking about cures with the patients. And the question then arose, and I'll show you the last couple of slides, well, if the CTLA-4 was one break, and if you blocked it, it helped. If the PD-1 was another break, but even stronger, and you blocked that, what if you put them together? I mean, what happens? Well, what happens is actually they work better than either alone. It's probably additive, but it shows the long-term follow-up. In yellow is the combination. That's the survival. So again, you don't have as much follow-up as some of the other graphs I showed, but here you're out two years plus, and it's kind of looking like it's plateauing. But look where the plateau is this time. Remember, we started out at 10% 20 years ago. Then we went to 20% with IPI. 35% with the PD-1 antibody. 
50 some odd percent. That's pretty good. Even the worst case scenario, so here is the combo of the ipium and the row amount versus the ipium alone. These guys, when they progressed, would have pretty much then gotten the CD1 antibody. So this is what we call a crossover. You either give them both together up front, or you first start with one, and then if they don't do well, you add the other. So those curves aren't that far apart, but e it doesn't matter either way. If the plateau is now 50%, you've gone from 10 to 20 to 35, and now you're at about 50 plus. That's pretty good. I mean, that's progress. And then if you look at another trial, this time it's not survival, it's lack of progression. So again, it compared giving both drugs to either alone, it was pretty obvious you'd rather be on the orange curve than on the blue curve or the yellow curve or the green curve. So it looks better to give them together. That's the good news. The not so good news is if you combine them, the toxicity is at least as bad as both drugs alone, if not a little more intense and long lasting. On the other hand, we've learned a lot about managing the side effects. A lot of these side effects are terrible, but uh, most patients do very well and will recover fully after getting the side effects. But this is again, more progress because look where that number is. If this translates into survival, we're now <coughs> at about 50-50. So we've gone 10, 20, 30, 50%. That's pretty impressive. And if you give the drug sequentially, and there's at least one guy in the room who had this sequentially, strangely enough, if you give the nivolumab then the ipilimumab, you do better than if you get the ipilimumab then the nivolumab. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you still do pretty darn well either way because it looks like, again, you're out more than two years, you're beginning to plateau. So whether you give them together or one right after the other, you're doing better and better over time. So what do we conclude? These drugs are called checkpoint inhibitors. A checkpoint would be a place where the immune cell has an opportunity to stop and be controlled or to pause. If you block it, you've given a checkpoint inhibitor. So you've released the brakes. PD-1, for example, is a pretty modestly toxic treatment. Ipilimumab is a little more toxic. The combo is more toxic than both, but the nice thing about PD-1 is you can induce shrinkage in a variety of cancers. PD-1 has been approved in melanoma, kidney cancer, bladder cancer, um, head and neck cancer, Hodgkin's disease, lung cancer, both types. That's pretty good. And it's probably going to get approved in ovarian cancer and a certain type of breast cancer. That's a lot of patients. That's probably 40% of all patients with melanoma or with, with cancer, not just melanoma. So that's pretty impressive. And there are other checkpoints. So remember, the, the cell is very complex. The immune system does not have one or two breaks. It probably has 10 breaks and 10 accelerators. And if you block any or all of them, you may improve the performance of the immunotherapy. And again, it turns out that the presence of this PDL one on the tumor probably predicts who's gonna do well and who's not. And it makes sense because when the PDL one binds the PD1, it kills the immune system. If you don't have PDL one, blocking it, it's probably not gonna help you. And again, the other marker is how many mutations do you have? If you don't have any mutations, you don't have enough abnormal proteins to be recognized by the immune system, so an immune manipulation is probably not going to work. And there are literally 100 trials ongoing of combining those PD-1 drugs, nivolumab and pembrolizumab, and now atezolizumab is the third one, with other drugs. And the question is, now we're into triple combinations. It's like you got Ipi, you got Nevo, and now actually, as of next week, I'll be adding a third drug. And there's another issue, which we don't have time to talk about, which is the financial issue. These are not cheap drugs. Ipi plus Nevo for one year is like a quarter of a million bucks. So what do you do if it's Ipi Nevo plus X? And it's uh, pretty damn expensive. But that's more of a social thing, and that I think will need to be tackled by this country in the future. But this is huge progress. I mean, to go from 10 to 20 to 35 to 50% expectation of survival at three, four, five years is real progress. So that's been the story. It's been an interesting ride, and the best is yet to come in my view. So I thank you for your attention.